Dating in a digital age certainly has its pitfalls. For the most part, dating apps and websites are aimed at the user making a split-second decision whether or not to connect with someone based on an instant look at their face and choosing whether to swipe right or swipe left. How many of you can honestly say that you've never gone on a date and when you first meet the person, you're like, yeah, they, they don't look like their profile picture. Internet dating safety is a serious thing, and as such, the majority of dating sites will guide each user with tips on how to be safe, tell a friend where you're going and who with, tell them what time you expect to be back, and provide updates when and if you can. But what about good old-fashioned meeting someone across a crowded room? You know, the organic old-school method of meeting a friend of a friend. The pitfalls of dating anyone that you don't already know are many. But with this story, there seems to be one pitfall that no one ever thought would be a factor in this modern age. Witchcraft. Hi folks, my name's Johnny and welcome to The Orist. In this story, we're going to look at a chap called Christopher Case and how his rejection of a strange woman would ultimately cost him his life. <laughs> Christopher Case was raised in Richmond, Virginia. His eclectic taste in music would lead him to a job as a radio DJ. He would be described as level-headed, intelligent and was a keen fitness enthusiast, keeping up with physical training and taking his fitness supplements daily. In his early 30s, he moved across to Washington State, Seattle to be precise, and began his new career as a music executive. You know the music that you hear in lifts and in waiting rooms? Well, that's what Chris did at his new job. He produced that type of music. Chris had many friends. He was well liked and made new friends easily, especially after moving to Seattle. He still kept in touch with his old friends back in Richmond, but despite being outgoing and friendly, Chris enjoyed his own company. We all like to be sociable and attend social events, but more often than not, we just like some alone time to chillax and do what we enjoy best. One of Christopher's passions was ancient music, in particular, music from ancient Egypt. Although liking a particular style of music is not uncommon, I'm fairly sure the music of ancient Egypt would be considered niche and very specific. That'll come up later. On the 11th of April 1991, Chris flew to San Francisco on a business trip where he'd be meeting with other music executives. This was exactly seven days before Chris's lifeless body would be discovered alone in his locked apartment. It was at dinner one night when he struck up a conversation with an older woman there. After some polite conversation, the woman had told Chris of her fascination with a particular type of music. Ancient Egyptian music, to be exact. Chris was naturally amazed by this coincidence, as this was a particular passion for him also. As the night went on, Chris and this older woman would exchange further pleasantries, when it became abundantly obvious, certainly to Chris, that the woman was seeking a little more than just friendly chit chat, but she would find her advances declined by Chris. She wasn't unattractive, that's for sure, but Chris just wasn't feeling the same vibe. She was quite a bit older than him, and as the night came to a close, Chris said goodbye to the lady whilst making it clear that he would not be going home with her. What's that old saying about a woman scorned? It was at this moment the woman became angry with Chris spurning her advances. Rather than insulting Chris or reminding him of the chance that he just threw away, she said something that he was not expecting. She told him that she was a witch and that she curses his life. In fact, that he would be dead within a week. Alright. Yep, standard response. Chris just shrugged it off. He didn't believe in all that kind of stuff. Thinking nothing more of it, the next day he travelled back to Seattle. When he got back to Seattle, he would later tell this story to a female friend, Sammy. They would agree that the woman was clearly a bunker nut and that they both joked that he probably had a narrow escape. It was on the night of the 13th of April, just before going to bed, that Chris would start hearing strange noises from within his apartment. He wasn't sure what the noises were at first, but later he would tell friends that he could hear voices coming from within his apartment but could never find where they were coming from. He would call Sammy the next morning freaking out and saying that he was kept awake all night by whispering voices. He also said that although he was definitely alone in his locked apartment, it felt like someone else was there watching him and that on several occasions he had seen strange shadows moving around just outside of his peripheral vision. Sammy reassured him 
and they both put it down to stress and sleeplessness. That was until two days later, on the 16th, that Sammy would receive another phone call from Chris. This time, he had told her that something had attacked him in the middle of the night. He told her that he had woken to a strange noise. He was convinced that he could hear someone breathing. The sound came from floor level off to the side of his bed, and despite his best efforts to sit up and check, he found that he was unable to move. What followed was a violent and terrifying attack. A pair of unseen hands suddenly grabbed Chris by the neck and began to choke him. Chris felt himself being physically lifted up off the bed by this unseen force and slammed back down. Why Chris chose to stay in the apartment is beyond me. At this point, I would be performing my special move, get the F out of Dodge. There would be a Johnny-shaped hole in that apartment door. I'm out. Against all odds, Chris would eventually fall asleep, only to wake up to find his bed sheets covered in blood. After trying to find the source of the blood, he found that he had 10 tiny cuts on the tips of his fingers. Obviously freaked out beyond belief, Chris went out in an attempt to try and get some answers. Of course, this being 1991, there wasn't any interwebs or Lycos chat rooms that he could check. He found himself in a bookstore called Evangel Incorporated and spoke to the store manager there called Rodney Higuchi. Mr Higuchi would later describe how Chris entered the store and picked up a whole bunch of crucifixes. Chris clearly realised his odd purchases and relayed his fears to Mr Higuchi, telling him that he believed he was being attacked by a possible paranormal entity. Higuchi would listen to Chris with a sympathetic ear and direct him to the occult section of the bookstore. Chris bought a number of books on defending against witchcraft, how to protect against unseen forces and negative spirits. He rushed home and started this defensive strategy. Placing several crucifixes all over the apartment, he laid down salt along the skirting boards of each room and across the doorways. He would burn scented candles said to ward off evil. Later on, there would be several handwritten notes found throughout his apartment on different ways to combat these evil spirits. Friends would later say at this time that he seemed like a totally different person, different from his usual rational, held together self. He would speak to other friends besides Sammy and they would say how they could hear in his voice fear and desperation. At this stage, it had been barely a week since his encounter with the older woman in San Francisco, but already Chris could feel his grip on reality slipping. The events in Chris's apartment only got worse. As on the evening of the 16th, Chris left his apartment in a hurry and booked into a hotel room for the night. Bearing in mind that this was the early 90s and as such landline telephones were the only means of contact. So when Chris's friend Sammy couldn't get hold of him and due to his recent out of character behaviour, she was naturally concerned. She contacted the local police department to conduct a welfare check on Chris. Unfortunately, when the police showed up to Chris's apartment, the doors were locked and there was no response there was not much else that they could do at this stage. They reported this back to Sammy, who also had no choice but to wait and hope that she would hear from Chris. She wouldn't have to wait long though, because that very night she arrived back home and saw her answer machine was blinking with one new message. She played the message and she was relieved to hear Chris's voice. In his voicemail, he said how the entity had almost got him the night before and he believed that tonight was the night that he was going to die. This would be the last time Sammy ever heard her friend's voice. On his final day on earth, Chris would visit a local priest and then pay another visit to the bookstore that he went to previously. Rodney Higuchi, the owner, would later state that Chris simply looked exhausted and desperate. He had asked for more advice on how to defend himself. Mr Higuchi helped him as best he could. On the morning of Thursday the 18th of April 1991, Seattle Police Department would get another call from a worried Sammy. This time, however, upon police arrival at Chris's apartment, they would find the door unlocked. After entering the property, the police could hear the faint sound of religious music playing and would find a large number of crucifixes on almost every wall throughout the apartment. They also found a large quantity of salt which had been distributed along the edge of each wall and doorway, culminating in tiny piles in the corner of each room. After clearing the apartment room by room and calling out for Chris to no response, they entered the bathroom. Police found the 35 year old fully clothed in his empty bathtub. He was in the kneeling position with his head resting against the wall. The bathtub was surrounded by even more crucifixes and candles. There were no signs of forced entry, no obvious clues as to how the 35 year old had perished. For all intents and purposes, he looked like he had just died in his sleep. 
His death would be ruled as heart failure or myocarditis by the coroner, a verdict which just wouldn't sit right with his family and friends. How could he possibly suffer a heart attack? He was in very good physical health. So let's look at myocarditis for a wee minute. I'm certainly not a physician, and this is only my opinion, but the Mayo Clinic website lists these symptoms of myocarditis. Fluid buildup with swelling of the legs, ankles and feet. Fatigue. Other signs and symptoms of viral infection such as headache, body aches, joint pain, fever, a sore throat or diarrhoea. From what we know, Chris didn't seem to be suffering from any of these, and let's assume for a moment that he was. What about the week leading up to his death? What about the fact that he even said to Sammy when he was going to die? Curses can be very powerful things. Let's put the supernatural aside for a moment. Historically, it's believed that curses work very similar, if not exactly like suggestion. The human psyche is weak in general, and we're very susceptible to suggestion, whichever form it comes in. In certain cultures and at various locations and times throughout history, curses are a large part of that culture. Is the mere belief in a curse powerful enough to produce a fatal heart attack in an otherwise healthy young man? Thanks for spending time with me today, folks. As always, your time is greatly appreciated. Take care of yourself and remember, if in doubt, swipe left.